In the coming episodes, we're going to talk about the hobby of model railroading. Most of us have various levels of expertise when it comes to building a layout. The owner of this layout has given us his permission to show you some of the do's and don'ts. This layout is fairly typical of most. It has some unfinished pieces on it, open tabletop. It has some scenery that's already laid down. It's got some structures. And not to be outdone by the typical model railroad enthusiast, there's no power pack on this layout to run any of the trains. Model railroading is a hobby that allows you to move at your own pace. For instance, you can do anything you want, but it's also nice to have operation. Wouldn't it be nice to have someone uh, switch in this space here, somebody to handle the industries over there, somebody to handle the industries here, somebody to stand in the yard and switch the freight that's in there, and then a fourth person over in the corner to handle the uh, cars for the uh, grain elevator and also take care of any local passenger service that comes on. But what if you don't know enough to build a layout on your own? Well, then maybe you get some friends together, and they've all got different areas of expertise, so you sit down and you form a track plan and you decide what to build. Well, that sounds great, but what if you don't know anybody? In the next 12 episodes, we're going to instruct you in the art of model railroading. We're going to provide you with information. For instance, did you know that there are four eras of diesel locomotives? Did you know that a computer can be used to run a layout? Did you know that you can also use 16 locomotives independently on the same track to operate independently of each other using just two wires? None of this will be any use to you, though, unless you have a plan. Let's take a look at some of the things that the uh, builder of this layout did. See up front here where all the track is already laid? The track is at varying heights, and some of it hasn't been maintained very well. Well, in our first episode, we're going to talk about laying track. We're going to take you all the way through sub-roadbed, which in this case happens to be the tabletop itself. We're going to talk about roadbed. Then we're going to talk about ties and the rail itself and putting down ballast. We're also going to show you how to use an NMRA track gauge so that you keep all of your rails aligned. But if you have a special application for a curve, or if you've got certain things that you want to lay yourself, we're going to show you how to hand lay track. First, we're going to take one rail and some spikes and spike it in place. These spikes are really miniature spikes like the real railroad uses. And we're going to spike about every sixth tie fifth or sixth tie. Uh, somebody that is a little more inexperienced than I am may prefer to use a three-point gauge to line up your piece of rail. Mm -hmm. You can take this, you lay it on the track, and you can center your pieces of rail. You know that the end of this comes to the end of the ties. Well, is it a good idea to put a spike opposite each other then on both sides? Yes, this allows for adjustments later on, too. Okay. If you start putting one spike on one side of one tie and then go down to another tie, you can end up with a zigzag pattern very easily. Mm -hmm. And hurt. once again, you need to sight down your rail. Just look down your rail to see if you're, if you're going straight as you go. Okay. There are over 30 turnouts on this layout. What's the difference between a turnout and a switch? Well, in the real world, a switch is part of a turnout. But in the model world, switches and turnouts, the terminology interchange. They both mean the same thing. This switch up front here derails some locomotives that go through it, but it doesn't derail others. You take a look at it, it looks just fine. But in our episode on switches, we're going to give you enough information that you'll be able to troubleshoot any problems you have with switches on your layout. You'll also learn how to custom fit a switch for that tight curve or out-of-the-way industry. And we'll also hand lay a switch for you. We've determined where our ties and everything are going to go by either the template or by the center line, or the lines we drew, the outside lines. And then here I stained them and ballasted. Mm -hmm. Come along and put the two stock rails in, put half of, a half of a frog in, which becomes the stock rail for the next one in this case. Came in, put the other half of the frog in, laid one of the point rails, laid the other point rail, the guard rails, and the tie bar, and now we can throw the switch. After you've got the switches down and the track is already laid out, a lot of people want to get into scenery. Well, so do we. Let's take a look at some of the scenery on this layout. You'll notice up front here that there is some um, plaster of Paris. It's laid down over screen wire. Over next to it, there is screen wire again, but 
there is some linoleum paste that's put down over the top of it. Then there's just some variations of ground cover that are pushed down on top of that, and it's stained a little bit. Well, in our episodes on scenery, we're going to show you a new technique. It's not actually new to you and me, but it's got a lot of variations that work very well. It's called hard shell. We're going to take you from putting down little paper hills, newspaper hills, and then covering those hills with uh, plaster of Paris soaked uh, paper towels. And then after the paper towels dry, we're going to put ready mix joint compound over the top of that. There it is, Chuck. That's hard shell. Just paper towels have hardened up, and uh, we're ready to do the uh, final layer of plaster. And this is the fun part. This works real easy. All you do is you take it and just like that. We're not looking for a real thick layer. Just spread it around, because remember, this will act as a glue when we get our secret formula of rocks and earth textures on. OK, you got a paintbrush? Uh, yeah, which size do you want? A uh, fairly wide one. And then you just take it and spread it around. That keeps it from getting too thick, because if it does get too thick, what happens is it, as it dries, it'll crack. We don't want that. We also want to be sure and cover up all of the seams from the paper towels. You can see now that what was a very irregular surface here is now smoothing out. Once you've got this area covered with a uniform thickness of plaster, you're ready to apply the ground terrain mixture, which is the rocks that we picked up earlier. Okay, it's very simple to do. All you just take and sprinkle them on. Okay, the larger stuff falls to the bottom, just like in real life. And you can see this is already starting to look quite realistic. The closer you look at this type of terrain, the more detail you see. Thus, the more realistic it looks. How am I going to get the loose pieces to stay in? This will all be fastened down later with a mixture of glue and water. We're also going to show you how to build a road and how to build a river. When we build the river, we're going to use an odorless epoxy that your family will love because it doesn't smell at all. After you've got the, the uh, scenery down and you're ready to go on to the next step, you have to take a look at accessories. Well, what are accessories when you're talking about scenery? Well, for instance, there are the pallets over here on this little freight station. Or they can be the trucks right over here that you're looking at. Or it can be the cattle sitting over in the yard. It can also be a building. Some people say that an accessory is nothing more than a building that goes on to finish off scenery. And they'd be correct on that. We'll tell you what, you what we mean by that when we talk to you about accessories. And looking at this area, one of the things I noticed in coming over here is everywhere I go, there's some construction going on. So let's take us some concrete pipe. And maybe what we're doing is we're building a culvert that's going to run and dump out here in, the, in your river runs over underneath the rail, the highway, and will service a big industry over here. OK, now we've put our truck out there to, for the concrete. And maybe we'll add one more little piece of earth moving equipment. You could add as much of this as you, you wanted. Now, if we were working near a highway, the next logical thing we would be having is some stuff up to protect the highway. So we're going to put up a few little flags here, put a few of those out, and say, hey, please don't run over us if you, if you can avoid it. And likewise, these also come with some little pylons. How many times have you seen a scene like this, mm -hmm. huh? That's what you want to do. You want to have something that looks like you've seen it before. After you've got the scenery down and it all looks pretty good, you want to operate. Well, so you need some power and control to do that. There are many areas today that deal with power and control for model railroads. The space age has finally entered our hobby. The miniaturized little chips and the new electronics make it possible to take a model railroad and operate it very much like you operate the real thing. You don't have to be stuck in a cab anymore, which is what this is, where all the controls are in one spot, and you sit here and watch everything move. You can actually physically go along. You'll see what we mean when we talk to you in our seminar about power and controls for model railroads. We started with a simple power pack in a common train set. We've gone through a more advanced throttle, 
up to a fairly sophisticated throttle with meters and a lot of momentum effects, flywheel effects, special braking effects. We've also looked at some of the state-of-the-art equipment, carrier command control systems. We've looked at a hybrid system that'll let you run both standard units and those equipped with special receivers. We've looked at a computer control system. And we've looked at a hobbyist or build-it-yourself system. All of these systems require the use of a receiver, a special module to receive commands or signals that are sent down the rails. Okay, you got the power down. You got the switches all laid. Everything looks good. Now you need some motive power to run it with. This layout uses current era Illinois Central Gulf and Norfolk and Western, now Norfolk Southern Railway. There are no steam engines on it, but we're going to take you on a trip to the Texas State Railroad where you'll get a chance to see a steam engine in actual operation. This is the seat everybody wants to be in. Episode after that will deal exclusively with diesels. We're going to show you the evolution of diesel power from the mid-1940s up to the present time. After you've got an engine down, you need something to pull behind that engine. So that's rolling stock. This is rolling stock. We're going to show you everything you wanted to know and talk about five or six different variations, including the kind of industries you have on your layout and the kind of rolling stock that should go with that industry. After you've got the rolling stock down and you're pretty well set to run, you may find some pieces of equipment that you don't want the same color. Or you may find some decals that you want to add to certain pieces of your rolling stock. Well, we have an episode that'll show you how to do that. We're going to take apart a brass locomotive and custom paint it and put it back together. We're also going to show you some decal techniques on all of that. But at this time, we're going to use a gray. Uh, I picked a medium gray. This particular one is uh, Southern Pacific light lark gray. We're just, again, we're using our number one brush, and we'll be painting the sun visor. Why the gray? Uh, we use gray to simulate a canvas, which was uh, general practice in steam days. It could be black. Uh, I'm sure that there was every color in the rainbow. As we got to this point, we've pretty well showed you everything you need to know. But how do you have fun with your trains? Well, in our last two episodes, we're going to show you how to play with your trains. We're going to talk about things like um, the moves that an actual railroad uses. Did you know that there are only two? I'm not going to tell you what they are today. You'll have to wait for that episode. But we're also going to take a look at repowering locomotives. We're going to take a can motor and put it in and use that for a realistic operation and motion. That's just one thing that you can do when you're playing fun, when you're having fun with your trains, because what you're basically doing is you're enjoying your hobby. We're also going to take a look at some interior kits for uh, passenger cars and for cabooses, as well as look at a few uh, crossing flashers and lighted signals. But that's a lot of material to cover, but I think we're ready for it. So your next question, I suppose, would be, well, where do I buy everything to get started on it? Well, I suppose that would mean a trip to a toy store. Hi, Clay. How are you? Hi, Chuck. This is Clay Rowe. He's the person that I come to in my local hobby shop when I have questions or need to order things. Clay, I've got some people with me today, and they're new in the hobby. I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could give us a basic explanation of what you tell a beginning hobbyist when they come into the shop for the first time. Well, Chuck, first I'll answer any questions they may have, then I'll show them what we have, and then refer them to our selection of books on prototype and model railroading. Can we take a look at those first? Sure. Okay. Chuck, the first thing I'd show a beginning model railroader would be the HO Primer. It has a good amount of information in it about starting model railroads and types of equipment to use and methods of scenery. Has it been around for a while? It's been around quite a while, but it's still the 
technology in it still good and a lot of the methods used in it are still touted today by some of your older model railroaders. The next thing I'd show a modeler would be this Atlas Blueprints book. And for a dollar, it has a wealth of information in it about small railroads. How many are in that uh, book? Uh, this particular book has 11 track plans in it. Okay. And the advantage of this book is it tells you everything you need to build that layout. Uh -huh. Although you can modify it for your own needs if you want to. Okay. For a modeler that's going to have a little more space to work with or just has a more of a more space, more, more room. space, more room. I'll show them this king size track plans put out also by Atlas. Now, if a hobbyist were to uh, model something besides HO, could they buy these books and still be able to? Oh do yes, them? you wouldn't have the um, exact parts you need outlined as you would if you were HO, but you could still take these plans and adapt them to any scale you okay. wanted. After the modeler has decided he is in the hobby for good and wants to have a selection of products to buy, I'll make sure and show him the H.O. Walther's catalog. Now, is that something that I can order from myself? Well, you can't actually order from Walther's because they are strictly a wholesaler. But this, this uh, catalog shows you everything that's available and stocked by Walther's, which is most hobby shops' main supplier. So I can pick something out of that and then contact you and you can get it for Right. Me. You can win the shop for items that you don't that we don't carry in the hobby shop due to insufficient demand or whatever. Well, what about all the rest of these books that are up here on the shelf? What, uh, well, what the rest they? of the books cover a variety of subjects on both prototype railroading and model railroading. Uh, some of them deal with specific roads. Some have more broad titles about diesel locomotives or steam locomotives or certain railroads. Okay, well let's assume then that I've got my track uh, plan already laid out and now I'm ready to take a look at uh, some equipment like some track and some other stuff. What do I do from there? Okay, then I would show you our Atlas track assortment over here. Okay. You see our Atlas display here. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll notice that we have two different types of track. Uh, snap track sectional and uh, snap track flexible. Now this is in uh, brass though, right? Yes, these are both available in brass and nickel silver. What's and I tend to push the nickel silver. Mm -hmm. Why that? Because the nickel silver doesn't require the amount of cleaning that the uh, brass track does. Brass track tarnishes and it has an oxidation on it that insulates rather than conducts electricity. Chuck, I'll show you Lambert switch and let you compare it to the Atlas. You'll be able to see where the extra price comes in. You see, it already has a metal frog, mm -hmm. but the whole, the guardrails are metal. There's not any plastic on there. Mm -hmm. the and there's not are... a big side mounted switch machine to ruin the looks of it. Uh -huh. This looks very prototypical. It is prototypical and it's very good quality as far as all the moving parts and the electrical conduction. Mm -hmm. And it's designed to be operated by either a ground throw, which is mounted to the side here, mm -hmm. or by under the table switch machine. Oh, I see, just mount one there and then, mm -hmm. okay. And it'll slide back and forth. Well, Clay, if somebody has already come to you and you've given them all this stuff for the track and uh, they've got their switches picked out and mm -hmm. the switch machines that they want to use and everything, and uh, say they want to get started in scenery and all, so uh, what do you tell them when, you're, when they're in to, to start on that? Well, I'll show them what we have in scenery. I'll also show them this book here, Scenery for Model Railroads. This book is an older book, and several newer books have come out on scenery, but this one still seems to be about the best there is as far as different methods and reliable methods of making good-looking scenery. If I've got questions, do I come back and ask you? Right. Okay. Come back and ask me, and I'll show you what we have available. This is... Uh this is actual grass, huh? Oh, no, that's synthetic material. And it's, some of them are dyed different colors to represent different types of grass or turf. Sort of like foam rubber and stuff right. like that that's just different colors. We also carry the Woodland Scenics line of grass, turf, ballast. They're one of the fastest growing uh, scenery operations and most of our customers take very well to their product line. Is it uh, competitive with uh, other things that you could buy in the market? Oh, yes. It's 
they've got a wide variety of uh, scenic details and buildings, small structures rather. When you get done with scenery in the model world, uh, usually people think of buildings and structures as part of scenery right. as well. You got something in that you can We show. have quite a large selection of buildings and kits. Okay, let's take a look at that. We have an inexpensive line of uh, plastic structures. Bachman's one of them. AHM has a complete line of plastic structures. And in a slightly higher price range, but still in an easy to assemble category is the Helgen Concord line of structures. Is plastic a good way to go for the beginner? Yes, and in some cases it's a good way to go for the advanced modeler because they can super detail these kits themselves just like the rolling stock mm -hmm. and airbrush them and make them look like some of the more expensive kits. You see we have the complete line of Campbell kits. They have a very nice uh, line of structures. Now that's all wood though, right? Well, most of it is wood, and some of the other uh, companies have plastic ones, but mm -hmm. with just much more uh, of a level of assembly than the plastic ones we just saw. But yes, the Campbell stuff is wood, and it requires uh, assembly and painting. Again, some of the beginners might have a little problem with this one. Uh, yes, they might. This is really for the more advanced modeler, although it's never too early to start. This is what? That is a scenic backdrop. What do and you... the purpose of that is, uh, along the wall, instead of just having a wall there, you might want to have this behind a s comparable scene that you've modeled in HO. And then I'd put buildings or something in front of it? Maybe. Right. And sometimes this can be a very effective trick and it really comes off looking like a horizon. Okay, well now we've got the track down. We've got some switches picked out. The uh, beginner pretty much knows where he's going to go with his scenery and his structures and all that. But one thing we haven't talked about is what you're going to run it with. So I guess that's power packs. These are transistorized and the quality and both the, both the quality and the price is comparable between now, these two. What about some of these little computer design uh, systems that I see now? Well, um, we do carry some of those too. The Hornby Zero One system we carry and have a few local modelers that, that use this that. system. Well, we've got the power pack. Now I guess what we need to take a look at is some rolling stock and maybe some uh, motive power. Okay, I can show you that downstairs. Okay. Chuck, we keep all of our freight equipment, locomotives, and passenger equipment on this wall here. As you'll see, we have uh, our locomotives in this section. This must be pretty confusing for the beginner, though, when he comes into the shop. What, what do you do with them? It can be. I guess the main thing that we need to stress to the beginner is to find one road and stick with it, because you can get an endless, endless variety of freight equipment but when it comes to passenger cars and locomotives, it's more authentic to narrow it down to one, maybe two railroads or a certain geographic location. Another consideration is the time period that you model. Some people only stick with the 1940s or contemporary railroading. A popular time period is the transition period between steam and diesel. Thanks for giving us the benefit of your experience today, Clay. We appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Clay, why is this, uh, why is this end scale layout in the store? Chuck, this layout is a joint venture between uh, Mr. Cook and Ben Phelps. Besides getting mutual satisfaction out of its construction, they've decided that it's a good way to show our customers the various stages a layout goes through on its way to becoming complete, if a layout can ever become complete. Well, Clay, I guess you could do any of these techniques anywhere. Yes, Chuck, you could use the techniques found on this layout in any scale or with any era. This is also a model railroad layout. It sits on about an acre of land. It runs on steam instead of electricity. It's one and a half scale to the real thing. It was built by Mr. Glenn Brown back in the early 60s. He did most of the work himself. 
He used a lot of the techniques to build this layout that we're going to show you in All About Trains. We are only going to be able to show you one scale in our series, and that's going to be HO primarily. But anything that we show you is designed to be operated and used at any scale. Some of the techniques that we're going to use when we talk about track laying can be applied to this. These tracks are a little bit wider than normal. What are they, Glenn, about nine inches? Seven and a half. Seven and a half inches. All you do is get a track gauge and lay it down and lay your rail by hand, just like we're going to show you in our next episode. In an episode beyond that, we'll talk to you about switches. We have several up here. They go in the same way. What's my point? That anything you do in a model railroad layout can be applied to any of the scales, O, O27, N, H, O, or Z. So don't worry too much about what you're going to see. Think more about the technique and how you can apply it to your layout. Afternoon, Herman. Hey, this is Mr. Herman Wilson. He's the Vice President of Operations for the Arkansas, Louisiana, Missouri Railroad Company. The A&LM is a Class II railroad. It's not a second-class railroad. It's what's known as a short-line railroad. It would be a perfect example of what a hobbyist could use to model. It has everything you need in a space of around 100 miles. That's about what its trackage is. The ALM is going to be our examples on All About Trains of what a prototype railroad is all about. You'll see examples of Mr. Wilson and I talking about track, switches, and how to run a throttle in one of these cabs. That's all we're going to talk about today on All About Trains. Join us for our next episode when we begin with track laying. Message for collectors and viewers of the program. See the collectors in a new time slot now, Saturday afternoon at 3. train